George Squalacci here to introduce you to the structure of a relational database. Focus for the moment on the middle of the diagram where I introduce some terminology and also you now have a new job role, the job role of a data modeler. It is the data modeler's role to determine what the structure of a relational database management uh, of, of a relational database should look like. So we start off introducing the term entity. So to create a database supporting a business application, you must first determine the entities of interest to the business application. Entities would be persons, places, things, or events that would be of interest to the business application. And regarding this presentation, our case study kind of business application would be an order processing application. So the entities, therefore, of interest would be orders, the customers that place those orders, the employees that sell those orders, the products that customers purchase, the vendors that those products come from, etc., etc. So the next point of interest is the term attribute. So regarding the business applications, one must determine the attributes of each entity that are of interest. For example, related to an order, you might be interested in knowing the date that the order was created, or the customer that placed an order, or the employee who sold the order. Regarding employees, you might want the first and last name of the employee, who the employee's uh, sales manager or boss is. Regarding customers, you might be interested in determining uh, the customer company name and contact name, shipping and billing address information, etc. So at this point, the data modeler would then create a table to support each entity. And within that table, create columns or attributes or fields representing each of the important points that need to be captured about those entities. In addition, a column, sometimes a combination of columns, would be created in each table which will be assigned a, a constraining mechanism, specifically a primary key constraint. And the primary key constraint's purpose is to impose the uniqueness of values in every single row of that particular table within that particular column. Now, we raise a little bit of a debate. What kind of a value should you use for a key field? And we'll see that we can use either a surrogate key or a natural key. So a surrogate key is like what we see in the current diagram. In the orders table, we have OID for orders, order numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. Similar in employees, we have the employee ID column, simple integers, same thing in customers. So a surrogate key is a key value that's generally a basic integer. More importantly than the data type is that the value or the key is completely unrelated to the data that it represents. In contrast, a natural key would be uh, derived from the data itself. So we might have a value like BKRD54MRD. Okay, what would that represent? So a natural key actually is derived from potentially or actually represents the data that it points to. So in my example, BK might represent bicycle. RD that follows might represent that it's a road bicycle. 5.4 might represent that it's a 54 centimeter frame size. And MRD that follows would represent that it's a metallic red bicycle. The general debate between should you use a surrogate key or a natural key is that you'll typically use surrogate keys because they're smaller and less subject to change and uh, generally perform better in joint operations. Now most of the time in a table you'll have a single key column but we'll find out later on in the presentation that's not always the case. So the next term that we have to introduce 
is the super important principle about relational databases, which is namely, you store each piece of information only once and refer to or point to that information everywhere else it's needed. So we find that the relational part of relational databases is implemented by a combination of primary keys in referencing table or in reference tables and foreign key constraints in referencing tables. So let's focus our attention for a moment on the relationship between the orders table in the middle of the diagram and the customers table at the left of the diagram. Now in order to store each customer piece of information only once instead of repeating that for every single order of that customer we have customer information in its own table and we'll find then from the orders table the source table which we'll call the referencing table we then point to a target table called the referenced table and so we'll have a column in the orders table, the CID column, implement a foreign key constraint pointing to the referenced uh, column in customers, which is the CID column. Now, when you place a foreign key constraint restriction between two tables, three restrictions come along with the foreign key constraint, and we see these in the lower left of the diagram. First, I cannot place a value in the referencing table that does not already exist in the referenced table. So what does that mean? Well, focus attention for a moment on the orders table and the CID column. What if we added a new row, that is added a new row, uh, a new order and attempted to add customer ID 99. This would represent a non-existing customer and would violate referential integrity rules if that were permitted in the database. So the foreign key constraint will not allow a value in the referencing table orders if it doesn't already exist in the referenced table customers. But that's only one of the restrictions. Restriction number two. Let's focus on the customers table and imagine for a moment in the customer ID column we change customer or attempt to change customer ID 33 to something like 3300. Well, if that was permitted, then you'll follow the foreign key constraint in reverse direction and we'll find that there are th uh, two orders for customer ID 33. Well, if this were permitted, then those orders would be orphaned in a sense that we wouldn't know where to ship them, we wouldn't know where to bill them, and this would violate referential integrity. So the default behavior of a database engine is to prevent or halt that activity from occurring. Now there is one option, it's infrequently applied, but it is available, and that is called on update cascade. Here's how that would work. If there is a customer ID that is updated in customers. For example, let's say we attempt to update customer ID 33 to a new number or new code. Well then, with the cascade option, the database engine would follow the foreign key constraint in reverse direction, locate every matching instance of 33 and in place replace with the new or updated value. Now the final restriction placed by a foreign key constraint we see also in the lower left and that is if I attempt to delete a value in a referenced table that already exists in the referencing table that is a prohibited activity by default. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have customer 66 customer 66, if we were to attempt to delete that, it would be prevented by the database engine. Here's why. The database engine would follow the foreign key constraint in reverse and find at least one order in the CID column that matches. 
So if the deletion of customer 66 in customers was permitted, then that would orphan any orders associated with that customer ID. We wouldn't know where to ship them, wouldn't know where to build them, etc. Now again, there is a, a modification on on delete called on delete cascade. If on update cascade was rare, then on delete is more rare. And I nicknamed this, not the greatest nickname, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Well, what we'll find then is if we have on delete cascade, let's say we attempt to delete customer 33 in the customer's table. The foreign key constraint would be traversed in reverse direction. The database engine would locate all matching orders in the referencing table and throw them out as long, uh, uh, along with the row in the customer's originating table. So again, this is not particularly uh, tip. This is not typical. Now, all of the relationships of features that we've looked at thus far are referred to as a many-to-one or just the opposite, a one-to-many kind of relationship. So if you look in the upper left of the diagram, you'll see that employees, each employee, could potentially have more than one order. And each customer can place more than one order. So the relationship between customers and orders is a one-to-many relationship. Flip that around, the relationship of orders to customers is many to one. So we see that these are a, a relative cardinality assignment. Now let's look at another situation here. Ask yourself, is it possible that a vendor could provide more than one product? Sure. Is it also possible that a product could be supplied by more than one vendor? Yes. So that being the case, the relationship between products and vendors is a many-to-many -many relationship. And what we'll find is that according to the relational model, we are not able to properly model a many-to-many -many relationship directly. So this requires the use of what some call a junction table. And in our case, that would be the vendor products table. So notice that vendors has vendor information and it has a it has a primary key column, VID. Notice products has its attributes and a primary key column, PID. But now how do we model a many-to-many -many relationship between both? The junction table called vendor products has a composite or multi-column primary key comprised of the vendor ID from the vendors table and the product ID from the products table. Okay, now the big story, drum roll, we'll find that a vendor ID in the vendor products table can exist more than once, but each time with different products. We see vendor ID 1001 more than once, but with different product IDs. Additionally, we might see a product ID more than once, like product ID 413, but arriving from different vendors. All right, so there you have it, the basic structure of a relational database. And keep in mind the most fundamental design principle, which is storing each piece of information only once and pointing to it from everywhere else. Now, the next part of the journey would be the normalization process, where we look for areas where there's redundant information within a table itself and then decompose that information into even more tables according to first, second, and third normal forms. Thank you.